here today. Uh, thanks for being here. If you're brand new, uh, let me just welcome you as well. My name's Jason, and uh, I love this church. It's a pretty good church, isn't it? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're pretty excited about it. Let me say hello to everybody online. I think it's this one here, right? Yeah, I hope you're doing well out there. I keep hearing uh, uh, lots of sickness is still going around, so that might be you uh, praying for you. Uh, hopefully you get better soon. We certainly understand and um, uh, hope that uh, all is going well for you. All right, as um, uh, Sarah said, uh, next week is Christmas, and uh, uh, right now uh, we are kind of building toward that, excited about our services. Please don't miss those. And then the 31st, I'm just telling you, Sarah talked about it, but don't miss that. We're going to really have a great day that day as well. So plan to make that day uh, with us in the morning. All right. So uh, we've been talking simply about Christmas 2023. Uh, and last week, uh, I spoke with you about what I just simply entitled uh, the invitation of the gospel. What are we invited into? Gospel means good news. It means good story it, uh, from the original language. Uh, it's, it's the good news of a savior that's come to the world. His name is Jesus Christ, and he, he is the good news. It's not about a good story. It's about the person of Jesus Christ, that he offers good news. And so we talked about this gospel, and we said, okay, what does this gospel, uh, uh, what, is, what is the invitation of it? Uh, and it wasn't just a, hey, pray a prayer, you're good, let's just live life. No, no, there's a, there's a reality of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that when we, through faith, uh, accept him as our Savior and understand what he's forgiven us from and the penalty that, that we all are born with and, and the reality of that, and then understanding what God in his love for the world was willing to do to send his son, what is the invitation of that gospel? And we, uh, we covered that. Uh, last week. And today what I want to do is I want to talk with you uh, in like what I would call the next step of what it means uh, to, uh, to understand the gospel and just simply say this. And there's two questions that we're asking today. What is it that this gospel offers? And then who is the gospel for? Right? This good news, what does it offer? And who uh, is it for? We're just going to talk about that all uh, day long. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 2. That's where we're going to camp today. We'll also go over to Luke chapter 2 as well and uh, just kind of uh, touch on some of those areas. So, and I, I've been saying this on a regular basis. I hope you have a Bible. I hope that you are marking it up. Uh, I've been preaching for many years and I'm still marking up my Bible. I was in uh, prayer and reading through our passages again this morning, I did some more marking. Like it's, it, it is a testimony of God working and reminding you of what, of what we're learning. So grab your Bibles, mark your Bibles. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we'll make sure we give you one. And uh, so, so mark it up. But if you're brand new or you're new to like church and so forth, um, we're going to have it up here on the screen. You can go to our church center app and, and follow along. We want to make it uh, easy for you to know where we're going, okay? So we'll be in Matthew 2 here today. Let me just tell you some of the characters that we're going to look at here. Uh, Herod's going to be a guy that's going to come up pretty uh, clearly in uh, Matthew chapter 2. The wise men. Uh, are going to be people that we're going to touch on here today. The shepherds, we're going to touch on them as well, right? So these guys are going to kind of come to the surface today as we ask these questions, who is it for and, and uh, what does the gospel offer? Now the context, I think this is pretty important because uh, one of the things that we know about the gospel story and, and what we know about the, the context of that day was that the Jewish people were looking forward to a prophesied king looking forward to a prophesied Messiah. And they were watching and they were anxious and they were eager because of the state that they were in. Now understand that if you were alive during this time, it was a pretty difficult time to be alive, right? Uh, if you were part of the, of, of the Roman world, the Roman culture, it was difficult. They had a psychotic, jealous, manipulating leader in Herod. He was not a good guy. And we know that by some of the things that he did, uh, even by, uh, out of his concern and jealousy and insecurity, he even ordered anyone under two to be killed because he was trying to kill this Messiah that had come. He's not a good guy. It was also unbelievably expensive to live during this time. 
uh, Caesar Augustus, he, he had issued, we know this, a decree. It was actually a, a tax decree. And everyone had to go and, to their hometown and register so they, so they could be properly taxed. Now, let me tell you about taxes during that day. Uh, it was, it's, history tells us that they were taxed upwards of about 50% of their income went right to the Roman government. And if you were a tax collector, you were given freedom to take anything off the top that you wanted to. And so history tells us that if you were part of the Roman world that day, that they're in some parts of different provinces and things like that, up to 75% of your income went right back to either tax collectors or the government. 75%. Now, that made Jesus' words even more powerful when he said, make sure you give to Caesar what's his. In other words, he's talking about taxes and then to give to God's what is God's. And so, listen, obeying the things that Jesus said in that world and that culture was difficult. So it was a pretty difficult time to be alive. And if you were a Jewish person, the idea that a king was coming, the idea that a Messiah was coming, the idea that a ruler was coming, the idea that, that someone was coming to give them freedom was a really, really, really eager and uh, exciting thing for them. And so we go to Matthew 2 and we learn a little bit about some of the characters and, and, and why it was uh, uh, so difficult to, to live in that day and the, what we see in Herod as well. So we're going we're gonna to read Matthew 2, some, some verses around that, and then we'll get into it, okay? Get it? Good, all right. So Matthew 2, let's look at verse 1. We'll go through 6, and then we'll skip down to verses 9 through 11, and we'll just have a conversation here together today, okay? After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's, uh, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. So you see kind of how it's all burning together and, uh, you know, chief priests, the Roman government, they kind of worked together and kind of kept peace and wanted to know what was happening. Okay, verse 5, in Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now hop down to verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star uh, they had seen uh, rose, uh, excuse me, had seen when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we see some characters rise into the story, and all of it is in the context of the good news of the gospel, the coming of Jesus Christ. So let's just go back to our questions. Who is it for? And what does this offer? And let's talk about that here for a few minutes, okay? The first thing that we understand and we see uh, is it's more of a, yeah, who is it for? Well, we need to understand at Christmas time in all of our lives, we need to remember that the gospel, that the good news is for all nations. It's for all nations. Uh, Each of the four Gospels, uh, we call them the synoptic Gospels. And the reason we call them the synoptic Gospels is because each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them sync together in telling uh, the story of the life of Jesus, his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection, all right? And they all tell the story of Jesus. And yet each author, all right, that makes them synoptic. But each author has a particular audience in mind. So Matthew is the writer of Matthew uh, chapter 2, of course. He's, he's the one that penned that. And his main audience are the Jewish people. And that's important that they're Jewish people because his purpose, his purpose was to show the Jews that Jesus was indeed that promised Messiah and the promised king. 
So the Jewish people were looking for it, and Matthew's audience are the Jews. But here's what's really interesting as we know that, as we understand it. What's interesting as we just read, the first people who come to worship Jesus in Matthew are the wise men. The wise men are Persian men, not Jewish men. And of course, we know, because we know what we know about God, that's no accident. Matthew's last words then, okay, we see that in Matthew 2. Matthew's last words in Matthew chapter 28 is a recording in the gospel, the Great Commission, where Jesus said, go into all the, all the nations and preach the gospel, to preach the good news. And so Matthew, what we see here, bookends his gospel with a focus on the nations. He begins his gospel by showing the nations the coming of the Messiah, and then he ends it by telling us to go and tell them about that Messiah. You see, we need to remember that the core, never forget this, the core of the gospel message is that Jesus has come to all nations. Jesus was not just a Jewish savior, and he certainly isn't just an American savior. He is the only savior for all nations, for all the world. I remember uh, when we were, the first time that we had the opportunity to visit Cambodia, I learned so much about how people viewed uh, God, the Jehovah God. And those in the East considered Jesus our God or the Western God. And somewhere along the line, there's been a breakdown and a misunderstanding that Jesus isn't just a Western God. He isn't just a a God for some people, but rather he's the only savior for all nations, right? That's who Jesus is. We need to remember that the gospel is for all nations. And so as a church, as a church, we cannot and will not, as long as I'm around, will not be content to just do church, We won't play church. We're going to continue to sharpen our axe and learn how to be better and understand culture and understand our calling and understand our unique, unique vision because people don't know. And we'll keep giving and we'll keep sacrificing and we'll keep going until everyone has heard. And Jesus is the one that determines that victory when everyone has heard, right? We don't determine that. He does, okay? So for you, let me just ask you a question, and for me. Are we, even this season right now, are we leveraging our opportunities to be a light for Jesus Christ in our families and our world? Let me just give you a very easy, easy applicational way to do it. Uh, over out on the, in the Welcome Center, uh, we have these WRGC cards. Maybe you've seen them, maybe you haven't. If you were to jump into my, my truck, you would see a stack of them just kind of put um, in a little area that I have there so I don't forget. Uh, and I've been grabbing them, and when I, when I go you know, have meetings or go out to eat, I've been trying to remember to grab these. Um, and then when I uh, interact with the server, by the way, you need to be nice. All right, it's okay to say this isn't right, but be nice right, um, and to kind of build a rapport with those that are serving you, right, and then when you fill out your bill, tip them, and tip them well, okay, uh, and then I always put this, I'm starting, I have been for the past month or so, putting this in that little booklet that, you know, that we put in there, right, well, now, now is, that, is that a major, major thing, no, 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 but here's what I'm after, I'm after us beginning to see and have a mindset shift, that we don't just live this for a personal, selfish purpose, this life, but rather we are on mission. So what, what, it, what it means is, is that everybody at, at Cracker Barrel, everybody at Bob Evans, everybody at whatever restaurant you love, they matter. And they're looking for hope. Don't, don't, don't miss that, okay? I'll tell you a story a little bit about that here as we close our time in in about an hour. Okay, that's just like my joke, isn't it? Uh, So so are you leveraging your opportunities? I've just been convicted about that, right? What if you went through a drive-through and paid for somebody and gave them one of those cards? You think about it. 
all right? So the first thing, that, what does the gospel offer? I think it's important to understand it's for all nations. We can't, we can't lose sight of that. We're part of something, guys. We're part of something globally. We're part of a movement of God. And it's the only thing that's gonna really end up mattering. It's for all nations. Get it? Good, okay. Uh, go back to our questions there. Uh, what does it offer? I think this is important. This is more of an offer question. Well, it unifies what I would refer to as a fragmented life. And many of us feel like our lives are fragmented. Like it's, it's just like, I don't know the purpose, all these things are going on and happening. You know, that's not like foreign to what happened in, around the birth of Jesus, right? It, it appears that there's a bunch of happenstance that happens around the birth of Jesus, right? Uh, Mary and Joseph uh, happen to be engaged, and then Mary shows up pregnant, right? Why didn't that happen at a different time? But right, it just happenstance that they were already engaged, and then she was up pregnant. Well, that's not happenstance. We know that. Or, or it's happenstance to culture that, that in, the, in the very time that Jesus is about to be born, that uh, a, a, a census is taken, and then they have to go to Bethlehem, which is the hometown, and they have to register there. Well, it's happenstance, right, to culture and to everybody that might be alive in that day. It's happenstance that while she's pregnant, they have to make this journey and go to Bethlehem. But the truth is, we know that the prophecy was completely under God's control and said that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. And these difficult things, Joseph having to understand that, that Jesus being uh, conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit is, is, is God doing something. He has to see what God is doing and, the, and begin to connect the dots that, that God prophesied that the Savior would be born. And so going to Bethlehem was a decree that was government was making them do. But the truth is God is the one that's leading them there. So it seems that there's all these coincidences or these, these happenstance type situations going on. But God is the one that is orchestrating everything that is happening. And we can't miss that, right? Matthew 2 shows us that, that God then, it seems like happenstance, God wanted pagan sorcerers to be among the first to worship Jesus. Was that happenstance? Well, maybe to culture, but not to God, Right? And so these pieces of the story of Jesus is being born, of Jesus being born, seem to be coming from all different directions, trying to be unified under what this larger story tells us. But what Matthew does in Matthew chapter two here is Matthew stamps his Christmas story with evidence of God's absolute control over everything. Over in verse six, he said, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. The prophecy was that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. And Matthew stamps this by saying, listen, God is in control of all of these things that seem fragmented and happening to everybody around. And we need to remember that it is God that controls the heavens, that he speaks through donkeys. Go read about it. He manipulates the governments. There is not one square inch of this entire universe over which God does not have complete control. He even used pagans as part of his arrival. And here's what I want us to see. If you are a follower of Jesus today, if you are what we refer to as a believer in Christ Jesus, he's doing the same thing for you as well. The same God who sovereignly arranged all of the stars in the sky sovereignly arranges every single detail of your life. It isn't happenstance. There is something bigger and greater going on. Book of Romans says that all things work together for the good of those that love him, who are called according to his purpose. We know that he, according to Paul, predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. It's all working together to form Jesus in you so that Jesus can be brought forth from you. Oh, that's good. Let me say that again. Don't miss it. It's all working together so that Jesus can be formed 
in you so that he can be brought forth from you. Don't miss that. It's not just happenstance. Now, let me just be honest. There's a seemingly um, disturbing (laughs) and yet at the same time comfortable truth that I'm learning. And I've been learning it in real time for about 40 years. And I'm gonna continue to learn it for the rest of my days, and I think you will too. It's both disturbing and yet it's comforting at the same time. And when I learn it in different circumstances, I kick and I scream, but I learn it nonetheless. And here it is. As we walk with God and our hearts continue to be open to his leading, over time, this is what happens. He begins to turn our what ifs into even ifs. Our what ifs being defined by wait a minute, what if this happens to me? What if everything goes wrong and this, everything I plan gets turned upside down? What, what if that happens? And many of us walk around in the what ifs of life and we are full of fear. And the Bible is full of phrases, 365 days of them, of fear nots. And God understood something about us and he understood, and he understood that what we would struggle with primarily is fear, that we would be tempted to walk in the what ifs of life. And let me tell you something, I'm with you. I'm with you. I struggle with it too. But the more that we walk with God, the more that we learn that, that this life and this world is not about happenstance or coincidence, that God is working, that he has already predestined us to be found in, in the image and the, in the conformity of his son, that he's prepared for us in advance good works for us to do, that he is sovereign, that he is in control, that he loved this for God so loved the world that he gave his son to know that we are secure, that we are children of God, that we cannot lose our salvation, that we are completely secure as his children, that when we walk with him over time, this becomes more and more and more real, and somehow in the economy of God, he begins to turn our what ifs into even ifs. And we kick and we scream and we fight and we avoid and we we struggle, but we get to the point somehow in our life that even if this happens, I know that he loves me. Even if this happens, I know that it's short term. And let me tell you something, I don't like it. But somehow in the economy of God, his peace, which the Bible says, transcends all of our understanding. In in other words, I may not be able to explain it. And like we talked about last week when Peter said that we are filled with this unexplainable, inexpressible joy. It can only happen in the reality of Christ in us because he's forming Jesus in us so that he can bring himself or bring himself forth through us. Now, that's not an easy message to hear, but somehow, somehow, the gospel invites us to that. And some of us have stories. Get it? Good. So we learn that It's not only for all nations, it also unifies a fragmented life. And then we also learn this, who's it for? It's for all walks of life. This is huge. It's for all walks of life. Go back over to uh, our passage, verses 10 and 11. It says, when they, talking about the Magi, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. They opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the wise men were part of this, right? We know that. 
They were, they were some of the first to be there. That's one walk of life, the educated, the wise, uh, the sorcerers, right? Uh, they were the ones that, that, that gave wisdom to life, if you will, okay? Highly educated. Then you go over to Luke chapter 2. I told you we would, we would touch on that here in a little bit. You go to Luke chapter 2 and look at verses 16 through 20. This is uh, when the angels had appeared to the shepherds, and it says this. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I would really love to know and have, hear Mary articulate what that meant. I'm going to ask her someday. Okay. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And so we said this already, but let's just review it. The first people to worship Jesus were pagans, and we also know now the first people to worship Jesus were the, uh, the people that were not highly regarded in culture and society of that day. They were the first people to worship Jesus, okay? And they were on opposite ends of the spectrum. Highly educated, not at all, okay? And in the eyes of the Jews, understand this too, this is huge as we looked at the context earlier, both the wise men and the shepherds were among the wrong kind of people. They were, didn't really have any business going to worship the king. They were, he was their God, not everybody else's, in their minds. It is highly significant that the first people to worship Jesus are uneducated roughnecks and pagan philosophers, wise men. And then a poor, unmarried couple who everyone else thinks is guilty of sin. That is just upside down but it communicates something very, very powerful. And we need to remember it, we need to see it. The gospel is the most inclusive worldview ever put forth. Because it brings together races, the rich and the poor, the educated and the uneducated, the righteous and the unrighteous, because it says that all mankind has a common problem. And we know, according to scripture, there's one solution, and that is Jesus. It levels the playing field. And so the gospel turns the world's values, and I entitled this message today, upside down, by making the basis of our acceptance before God. It's based on his grace and not our merits. It's a message of the gospel. So now, with all that said, get it? Good. What is our challenge? Our response to all that? Well, we need to remember, and I've said it, but let me just unpack a little bit more. People matter. People matter. Your interactions matter. Your boss matters. Right? The uncle that comes to Christmas matters. Right, Cousin Eddie, right, whatever. They matter. They matter, they matter, they matter. And we are given, whether we realize it or not, we are given opportunity if we'll open our eyes to see it. And you're gonna fail, and you're gonna succeed. Let me give you examples of how I have failed and how I, uh, by God's grace, succeeded. Uh, just This was just um, like three or four weeks ago. You know, we ordered uh, some things off of the Christmas Superstore, Amazon. And uh, they weren't right. And so I had, I had three or four or five boxes. I don't know what it was. And I, I took it back to uh, a particular UPS store that I'm not gonna tell you where it is because you'll go there. Don't do it. Or you'll have, or you won't go there. I mean, that's a little thing. But um, I went there and had these boxes and I had my phone and, and um, uh, you, know, you have to do this whole return, like, 
process, right? On your phone and return codes and all this stuff, right? They make it pretty easy, but you gotta walk through a process. And I walked in and because I had multiple things to return, um, I didn't really know how to bring everything up and be prepared. And so I, so I walked up to the counter and I said, I wanna return those. And the, the person, there are two people behind the counter and they had, it was the exact opposite of Christmas cheer. <laughs> they were angry because they were dealing with people like me that bought wrong sizes, right? And, uh, and I said, so I need to return these. And they're like, do you have your, your return started? I said, come again? They said, do you have your return started? I said, well, I, I have to go through and, and, and do that here on my phone. They said, you need to have it all ready before you walk up to the counter because I'm not just gonna stand here while you, this is true. I'm not gonna stand here while you do this while other customers are in line. I turned behind me and looked. I was the only one in the store. <laughs> True story. Now let me tell you where I failed. Number one, I didn't care about this guy's salvation one iota, okay? <laughs> this is what I said. I'm, I'm just being, being honest with you. I go, yeah, I, can, I get that because, man, you are overwhelmed with people, aren't you? I said that to him, all right? Pastor Jason, okay? I didn't do it in our town. I made sure of that. So I go over, right? I go over and I stand there and I'm figuring this thing out. I finally figure it out and I walk up and I'm just miffed, right? And I walk up, I get them returned and they said, okay, thank you. Have a great, sir, great day, sir. And I said, okay. And I just walked out, right? Now, let me tell you something. Were they a jerk? Yep. Is the customer always right? Yep. But I didn't care about them at all. You see, there's a reason why people act the way they act. I don't know all the reasons, but there are always reasons. And it was an opportunity for me, right, in that moment to look at them and say, okay, whatever you need, because you have your own processes and policies. Whatever you need, um, I'll make sure I walk that through. No problem. I could have been that way, but I wasn't. And I remember, like, it was, I, I was still mad when I drove away, right? I had all these brilliant things I wish I would have said. Let's just be honest, okay? A couple days later, like, you know what, Lord, as I was praying about wanting to be on mission for him. Like, Lord, you know, I, I need to confess this. I just missed an opportunity. But in the Lord's graciousness, it's okay. So listen, maybe you are someone that is, that is pretty, you know, you get frustrated pretty easily, okay? I would encourage you to confess that to the Lord that I tend to get frustrated easily, if that's you. Maybe you're not very patient, Right? But there are people that we interact with every day that need our patience. And by the way, I didn't give him one of the cards. <laughs> okay? Now, that's where I failed. Maybe you have stories like that too. But then by God's grace, he gave me the opportunity to totally redeem myself. You can name that movie if you know what that means, what that's from. Uh, this is just like a week and a half ago or something. We were... Um, getting ready to have our team meeting, and um, I didn't pack my lunch that day, and, and I, so I ran over uh, to Subway right here in, in Macedonia. And I walked in, and there was one other guy there, and I walked in while he was ordering. Uh, he was a city employee here because of the way he was dressed, and a real nice guy. He was talking to everybody, and, and uh, he ordered his sandwich and everything, and, and then uh, they were making it, and then I ordered mine. And uh, they were starting to make mine. And I just went over to the drink, uh, uh, fountain drink area. And I was getting my, my drink and, and uh, he was up there to pay. And, uh, and he said, uh, oh no, my wallet's in the truck. Like, no problem. So he runs out and, and, uh, and in the meantime, I went and paid for mine. And, and uh, he, runs, he runs back in and he goes, on the way up to the counter, he goes, guys, I am so sorry. He goes, I must have left my wallet at home. I'm sorry. To, he wasn't asking for anything free. He's like, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'll, I'll give that to somebody else, whatever, right? 
And I was, I was still there, and the Lord just said to me, you know what, how can you love this guy? So I walked up, and I said, hey, let me get your lunch. He said, no, no way, no, no, don't, you know, all that whole thing. I'm like, no, really. Merry Christmas. Thank you for serving our city, and thank you for, for, um, for what you do, right? And all I did was spend way too much for a sandwich, okay? <laughs> Apparently got a foot long, you know, but uh, way too much for a sandwich, and then gave him one of those cards. Now, if you're here, you're listening, you're an illustration, okay? Now, listen, I don't say that to have any, any reflection on me. Here, here's why I say those things. The good news of the gospel, who is it for? It's for everyone. What does it offer? It offers hope. And in our fragility, like we're gonna fail, in our own sinfulness, we're gonna fail, as I sure do. But what if we, what if we began to view our interactions as opportunities to be points of light for people? That we got up in the morning and we said, God, what's gonna happen today isn't just by coincidence. Like you're organizing everything that's going to happen in my day. You're organizing the frustrations. You're organizing the, the texts that come through. You're organizing the conversations with my boss. You're organizing the, the, the uh, interactions I'm gonna have with people in stores. And you're organizing the interactions that I'm going to have with my family. And God, the good news is for all of them. And what if we got up in the morning and said, God, would you allow me, would you allow me to be part of communicating the good news of Jesus Christ? I wonder how that would change a reputation. I wonder how that would change, you know, that just the reality of God's people in the communities in which we live. So ask yourself this question. How are you viewed? Think about it. How are you viewed by people? Who is it for? Well, it's for everyone. <laughs> what does it offer? It offers hope. Get it? Good. Let's be on mission. Invite people to Christmas Eve service. Invite them to church. All those things. Let's do this together. Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to look at your word to, this morning, um, to understand it. Uh, Lord, to begin to apply it. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that you use Matthew and Mark, Luke, and John, all these, these guys that uh, followed you as your disciples and then uh, recorded um, uh, your life uh, so that we can understand it. God, I thank you for the clear view. If we, if we will just open our eyes to see you throughout your word and what you're doing and how you're orchestrating everything for your glory and your purpose, Lord, that that um, gives us security. It gives us hope it first turns our what ifs into even ifs. Lord, that's a, that's a major maturity thing and you've promised to take us there. Um, and I pray that you would allow us to always say our next yes so that we might experience that inexpressible joy, that peace that passes the understanding in our minds, Lord. And then, Lord, for us to turn and say, okay, not only are you forming yourself in us, you want to bring forth from us the good news of the gospel. And God, I want to be that man that um, in my failures continues to, to fight the fight that you've given me for your glory. 
Now, Lord, I know that my brothers and sisters, my friends, my family here want to be that as well. And I pray that you would unify us, that you would allow us to be uh, of one mind, to recognize that it's not about doing church or, or organizing something, but it's about people always moving closer to you and then simply allowing your, you to be brought forth from us. God, I pray that you would pour buckets and buckets of resource upon this place. I pray that you would bring just a, a, just a movement where people are trusting you as their savior through the movement of God's people here. I pray that we would see uh, just more and more healing take place. Healing of marriages. Healing of uh, regret and guilt that only your gospel can, can heal, the person of Christ. God, we long for you. Would you, God, just continue to be faithful in each of our lives and our church? We thank you so much that you've allowed us this season to be alive to be on mission for you. Help us to open our eyes and see for your glory and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.